there's a very serious epidemic of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa, and specifically in southern African countries. Um, in South Africa and Swaziland is probably where it's the most serious right now, and, and the numbers are, de are devastating. Uh, I would say that they, they approach about 20 to 25 percent among the adult population um, in terms of HIV, HIV prevalence, HIV infection, and uh, in prenatal clinics among women, it's as high as 40, 42 percent in Swaziland, which is, um, which is devastating. It's a very serious crisis. It's interesting for me to consider the similarities between the situation in Greece right now and what South Africa was like under apartheid, and in some ways still is like now. Um, and they have to do with the rise of a police state in this kind of context. And again, uh, which, was, which was justified by, by fomenting people's fears about, um, about people different from them. And that's what justified and sort of legitim legitimated the rise of, of uh, a very excessive police force in South Africa. The situation in South Africa was mostly that um, as people became increasingly destitute in rural areas, they ended up moving into, into urban centers uh, um, around southern African cities, mostly on the outskirts of cities. Uh, and then slum populations would develop um, that would include up to and more than 100,000 people in any given location. And those were considered sources of, epidem of epi epidemic disease by the South African state. But the real concern, if you read behind these documents, if you read behind the correspondence um, between state officials, uh, had more to do with fears about, um, about uh, political uprising among the, black, among, among the black population. That's what they really wanted to target. But they used public health as a way of justifying forcibly removing these people into areas that could be more easily policed and controlled. It's a relatively big question among scholars today um, who are trying to figure out why uh, HIV transmission and prevalence is so much higher in Southern Africa than elsewhere in the world, uh, because the, the numbers are just dramatically different. And the reason that, that I would give for my own research is that, uh, um, is that the region is, um, is characterized by a very long-standing network of labor migration that was set up during the colonial period to draw very cheap labor from African rural areas into white cities uh, to be used for on mines and implantations for European capitalists. And uh, the workers were not allowed to stay in white urban areas. They were expelled back to the reserves at the end of their contracts at the end of each year, essentially. Uh, and this flexible labor regime um, strung workers across the subcontinent from as far away as Malawi, coming down to mines in South Africa as early as um, 1870s, basically. Um, and so when HIV was introduced to the, con to the continent, this became sort of an epidemic waiting to happen. It traveled along these migration routes. Um, and uh, th that's one of the reasons that it, it, it became so expansive when, when, it, when it was introduced in the 1980s. Um, but it was dramatically ex exacerbated by IMF, by, by, the, by the economic policies of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Um, which imposed austerity measures in beginning in 1979, but throughout the 1980s and 1990s, that had the effect basically of cutting economic growth in these countries in half. So what we have is a situation in, in many poor countries in Southern Africa where they're actually paying more of their budget to loan repayment than they are towards uh, basic social services like education and healthcare. And so in Swaziland, for example, it once, it once had a, a relatively robust public healthcare infrastructure, but that's been totally eviscerated as the World Bank and IMF have forced Swaziland to, to, to cut its budget on healthcare in the midst of a national emergency epidemic. Uh, and so there's absolutely no way they can, even, they can ever hope to curb this epidemic as long as the IMF controls their economy in this manner. The problem here is that when people, have, when people lack access to, to stable jobs and stable sources of income, then they end up engaging in risky sexual behavior. This is particularly true of women who, uh, who end up pursuing transactional sex, which means exchanging sex for money, be that in the form of prostitution or in the form of everyday relationships with people that they know, uh, just because they, they need to stave off hunger. So they're willing to risk um, HIV transmission in order to stave off um, a greater risk to them, which is, which is hunger. One of the interesting things about the way that AIDS is talked about in sort of mainstream discourse um, is that they blame the victims of HIV for, uh, for their problem and consider them to be basically morally depraved. Uh, and this, this is a discourse that relates specifically to um, Western or European conceptions of blackness. Black people tend to be blamed as naturally sexually path uh, pathological. Um, a profoundly racist discourse that totally obscures the actual causes of this epidemic. Really, the moral depravity and the personal pathology lies, once again, 
uh, with, the, with the powerful actors that are constructing um, economies in such a way that these people end up in conditions where uh, we're making decisions that are risky in terms of HIV, HIV transmission are basically inevitable. If we look at countries that have succeeded in rolling back HIV prevalence rates, they are directly attacking some of those economic policies that are causing HIV in other countries. I think Brazil is an amazing example of this. The way that Brazil has rolled back its HIV epidemic in, in dramatic proportions has been by directly targeting access to generic antiretroviral drugs and uh, um, useful public health infrastructure and citizens' rights. Another interesting example is in Malawi where, where fascinating research has been done by scholars who show that by giving women uh, direct cash um, uh, transfers, it actually reduces their susceptibility to engagement in transactional sex. And what that tells us is that when women have access to formal employment and steady incomes, then they're less likely to, to, to pursue incomes through transactional sex and, they're, and therefore less likely to, uh, to contract HIV. So all of these cases prove in Malawi that there's a direct relationship between access to stable income and HIV risk. Uh, um, which further illustrates the data that we've known for a long time, and that's that poor people um, and low-skilled workers are dramatically more vulnerable to HIV transmission than those who have steady jobs, those who have higher incomes. So HIV is a, social, a socio-economic problem. Um, uh, we can't blame it on, on individual pathology. We have to think more broadly to the economic policies that are causing contexts in which HIV transmission is basically inevitable for poor people. It's been interesting for me to look at the way that in Greece this has been constructed as a, as a tension between human rights on the one hand and, uh, and public health or sort of broader social well-being on the other. And I think that's really kind of a false dilemma. Really, we can use human rights to target the problem. Uh, people that are, that are vulnerable to HIV transmission because they're drug users or because they have to pursue transactional sex or because they have to migrate. Uh, we can think of that as a human rights problem. They need more rights, not less. They need rights to, uh, to decent public health services. They need rights to education for skills training. They need rights to employment. Those are the things that are going to solve the problem, not diminishing their rights, treating them as second-class citizens, and uh, excising them from the general population.